the type of people that know these things that I'm about to share with you all today, they tend to not to share it with others. Because if you wake up to this stuff, you are literally the worst nightmare of the system. You are Neo when he realizes he's the fucking one. Welcome back, everyone, to the Conscious Wealth Podcast. Hope you guys enjoy the new setup. Got some lights going. We got some, some books, some dictionaries going. Legal dictionaries, of course, Black's Law. And uh, I'm excited to upgrade our content for you guys and hopefully allow this life-changing information to reach the hands, minds, and hearts of more people who really, really need this information. So. Before we get into it today, just want to say thank you to each and every one of you who have shared this with a friend, shared this on social media, told even one friend about this, talked about these concepts to some of your loved ones. Any of that goes a really, really long way, and you never know the ripple effect of your actions. So that's why we're here today, and what we're going to be doing today is going to be a little bit different here on the Conscious Wealth Podcast. Normally, I tend to just go on these nice rants, right? And I have a lot of information in my brain. Having said that, today I want to get a little bit more granular for you guys, and I want to give you an inside look at how we normally do things in the Level Up Collective. So what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be giving you guys a bit of a masterclass on etymology, which for those of you who aren't aware, is the study of the origin of words. And if you are unfamiliar with this, this single concept, this single field of study, some of the seeds planted today can change your entire life. When you start to learn the power of words and you start to unlearn a lot of what you've been taught, around what words supposedly mean, and you start to learn them for yourself rather than relying on others to tell you what things mean, which is what school does via memorization. You start to actually look, go to the source, the root, you find it yourself. What you start to find is this entire system, all of the programming unravels because the truth is right in front of you. We just don't read. The Bible talks about the truth shall set you free. And that is a spot on parable. And furthermore, to totally butcher another scripture, which I really like, Hosea 4 6 talks about how our people perish for lack of knowledge. We don't perish for the reasons we think, we perish for lack of knowledge, for ignorance. And where does knowledge start with? Well, how do we consume knowledge or transfer knowledge? Words. So words literally make up the foundation of our 3D reality. And for most of us, we've never stopped to take inventory of, are the words I'm using accurate? Are they empowering? Do they mean what I think they mean? And what are the second and third order consequences of using these words or allowing these words to be used on me via contracts or consent or some of these notions. So I'm really excited to dive into this today for you guys, even put together a little presentation for you. So if you see me, you know, looking off to the side or whatever, that's because a lot of what we're going to be going into, I don't want to be telling you guys my opinion. I'm going to be bringing up Definition after definition, fact after fact, right? I don't want this to be the Jeremy opinion show. I'm bringing you guys law. I'm bringing you guys scripture. I'm bringing you guys text, things you can dig into for yourself, right? So without further ado, let's dive into our introduction to etymology. So before we start, I want to cover a few different things. The first thing is when you've never actually met someone who legally lives by completely different rules than society tells you that you have to live by, it becomes next to impossible to strive for a better life. 
which is what I believe the life that our creator has ordained for us. The type of people that know these things that I'm about to share with you all today, they tend not to share it with others. They tend to not tell anyone. They tend to keep it in the family. And I totally get why. They usually don't want to invite that trouble into their life. By simply sharing a lot of the things that I share on social, I've invited all sorts of energies that want to take truth down. So I get it. And then there's also people that are just so free, so content that they don't feel the need to share the wealth. I get that too. But I do believe we are here for service and we're all walking each other home. This is the least that I could do. So I hope you guys enjoy it. So what we're going to be going over today is a roadmap of sorts. It's a blueprint showing you that there are, in fact, two possible realities that you can live in moving forward, exactly like The Matrix. Yet another reason why that's debatably my favorite movie of all time. You can take the red pill or you can take the blue pill, right? Split in the road. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. One of these realities is stepping forth as a sovereign individual. And I don't want to get go down the rabbit hole of, you know, what does sovereign even mean? I'm not talking about becoming a sovereign citizen. That doesn't even make sense. We don't teach that. So please do not ask me that. I'm talking about metaphysically as well as components legally, i.e., living your life in the private, in the private domain, not as your shaman, etc. That's one reality. The other reality is you can continue living as a citizen. That first reality is all about you being a natural person, which is your living lowercase name. Your lowercase name represents you, the blood and flesh, natural living person. The other option, which most people choose due to convenience, or ignorance, or fear, whatever, is you are actually a corporation. And we're going to be getting into this a little bit as some of the basics. So when you're a corporation, not only are you dead, you're legally dead, but you're also what's called a legal fiction, which I'll get into in a minute. This is your all caps name. So I want you to go look at the last bill you've got. And I want you to look at who it's addressed to. Is that addressed to your all caps name or is that addressed to your lowercase name? Nine times out of 10, it's going to be your all caps name. And what do you do? You respond to that, i.e. consenting without knowing that's what you're doing, and you pay the bill or whatever it is. You take the liability. But that isn't you. They're tricking you. So let's go a little bit deeper. So before I move on, last thing I'm going to say, for anyone who's currently not operating, out of a private, common law, irrevocable trust, out of the jurisdiction of the United States. You're subject to the jurisdiction of the In God We Trust, the United States Corporation. Yes, the United States is a corporation. Hopefully you know that by now. This is why you may have noticed that life seems so hard. The laws and the rules only continue to get worse, right? More statutes, more mandates every single month, quarter, and year. Your freedoms are only going to continue to be taken away as a citizen because citizens have privileges. They've accepted privileges in exchange for losing their rights. It's important to recognize that as a citizen, you're viewed as what's called chattel in the eyes of the law. And chattel is exactly what it sounds like, cattle. You're viewed as literal property kind of like an animal. So I know that's a little heavy, but I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be going into and some of the basics of how today's talk is going to be showing you two different worlds that exist simultaneously. Because when I start to talk to you about words that you think you've known your whole life, you're going to have a decision to make. Do you continue to stick with the definitions that you've been taught? Or do you open your mind and go, what if what he's saying is true? I'm going to look into this deeper and decide for myself. 
and the implications of that single conversation that you hopefully are going to have for yourself will alter the trajectory of your entire life. What does someone do when they've been living for 20, 30, 40 years under the understanding that here's the rules to life, here's here's the meaning I've ascribed on life, and then they just one day are shown none of that is true, none of that is real. Welcome to my reality. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to briefly just want to read a direct quote from a paralegal book. So one of the training books you have to read when you're a paralegal to prepare you to take your tests that you need to take before you become certified as a paralegal. It says, in the legal profession, the accurate use of words is crucial. Some lawyers, in fact, suggest that the practice of law rests almost entirely on the precise use of the English language. The following pages introduce you to a broad range of basic legal terminology needed to embark on a career as a paralegal. Complete familiarity with common legal words and phrases is required when creating and interpreting legal documents. Here's the most important part. As you'll see, inaccuracies that might strike a lay person, that's them talking about you, homie, aka a basic, <laughs> might strike a lay person as trivial, can give rise to serious legal consequences. This highlights the importance of both understanding basic legal terminology as well as using it. So I wanted to use that as somewhat of a preface so you guys can understand what's the big deal? What does it matter if, you know, my definition of a word is slightly different? Well, in law, it's a game of inches. It's a game of the most minute detail. It's like chess, but you have a microscope and you have to be deadly with your accuracy. And if you don't understand what a word means or you're using it incorrectly or they're using it and you don't understand to counter it, you're going to get eaten up in commerce. Everyone wants to talk about sovereignty. Oh, I want a homestead. Oh, I'm looking at all these plots of land. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to pay taxes. I'm not going to deal with their systems. I'm going to own the land. I'm going to live off the land, et cetera. That's all great. But do you know the basics of how to enforce your rights? Do you know the basics of law, which means the basics of words? Before we can even get into application, we need to understand what we're going to fill our exhibits or documents or templates or frameworks with. Even verbally, do you understand how to stand on your own and speak about your rights using the proper language? So there's not miscommunications. It can't be misconstrued that you said something different, right? So this stuff is really important, like so important that it wasn't taught to you in school. Imagine that. That's how, you know, at this point in my life, that's how I gauge how important something is for you to know. If it was intentionally left out of being taught to you in school, it's probably really fucking important. <laughs> so there's a little barometer you guys can start using. All right. So first things first, we're going to put this up on the screen for you guys so you can so you can check it out. But I'm going to read this quote for you directly from Trump on September 18th, 2019, when he was still president. He says, and I quote, you people trying to insult my intelligence if I read the U.S. Constitution. OK, how many of you able to figure out the 14th or able to figure out how the 14th Amendment works? In case nobody knows, the infamous 14th Amendment was designed to put people as a legal fiction, giving up your rights for privilege and immunities. By voting for me or anyone in office, you committed a crime against your Republican form of governments. Try to figure that out first and then ask me if I read the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> That's insanely fire. And... We're not going to get into politics at all. I don't vote. I haven't voted. I will not vote in the future. It's all fake. Having said that, what I loved about Trump is he drops commerce gems all the time. For those of you paying attention, for those of you listening, 
And when he dropped that, I was like, I cannot believe he said that. That like you talk about a cheat code, right? So that's a game changer. Now, what I want to do next is I want to kind of break this down. So first things first, he talks about this concept of legal fiction, which if you're not familiar with what that means, what he's referencing is first we need to go back into the word person. So if you see on the screen right now, the definition of a person, you should see that a person can mean an individual like you and me, but it can also mean a corporation, a partnership, a trust, etc. So in other words, a person, by just saying, let's say someone asked you uh, on a recorded line, are you a person? You'd of course say, yeah. Now you might have just consented to them asking you, are you a corporation and liable to be treated as such? And you say, yeah. And you think you said you were a human, but they're interpreting that as you're a corporation, right? So it's really important, this concept of person. Now, taking that a little bit further, a legal fiction is referencing this kind of person. So when you're a person, but not a blood and flesh natural person, you're being classified as a person broadly, which could mean business, it could mean partnership, it could mean trust, it could mean bureau, it could mean institution, et cetera. This kind of person is referred to as a legal fiction because it represents something else. It's kind of like if you have an NFT and that NFT represents that you have ownership of something real and tangible, your NFT represents something else. Well, your legal fiction represents something real or something different, but it, it itself isn't that. So it's kind of like this fake like mask or hat that you can wear and then you just take it off. That's what a legal fiction is. Now, this kind of takes us into your straw man. That's really what he's talking about here. So let's read this again. In case nobody knows, the infamous 14th Amendment was designed. He didn't say it accidentally. It was designed by our founding fathers and also those who revised it to put people as a legal fiction, which means homework for you guys. Go study the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, and you're going to see what he's talking about. It talks about persons <laughs> and their rights. Now, it doesn't say people. It says persons. That's all I'm going to give you. You need to understand who or what that's talking about. So he's given a lot of game here, right? So let's go a little bit deeper in this concept of the straw man. So for those of you who aren't familiar, homework assignment one is to dive into the 14th Amendment and just start studying it. Read it. Read it again. Read it again. Get out of Black's Law Dictionary. Start deciphering what those words mean. Get out. Pull up Cornell Law. Start deciphering what each of those words mean retranslate the sentence until it makes sense based on legal dictionaries. It's not what you think it is. That's homework one. Homework two, if you haven't yet, watch Straw Man, The Nature of the Cage documentary. It's free on YouTube. And you'll start to understand a lot of what I'm talking about here. But at a basic level, your straw man was created at birth, right? When your parents consented to a birth certificate, that was not you. As soon as that birth certificate was stamped and signed, you died. You, the natural person, ceased to be. And from that day forward, you've been answering for, taking full liability for, being billed for, charged interest for, sent to jail for, etc. A legal fiction. The entire system of the United States Corporation, every aspect of it, deals with legal fictions. There's no such thing as people anymore owning property. People cannot do commerce. People cannot exchange in barter or do business. People cannot pay taxes. People cannot go into business. Everything you think you're doing, people can't lend. People can't borrow. Everything you think you're doing as you, you're not. You were assigned a legal fiction. So from that day forward, on your birth certificate, go look at it. I'm going to guess it has your name in all caps and black ink. 
Now, black signifies death. Just think about it. Natural blood and flesh living beings sign in red. Is your name red on there? No, it's probably black. Okay, so sus, check one. Next, is your name lowercase, like a natural living people? People, not person. Is it lowercase, like a natural blood and flesh being? Or is it all caps? It's probably caps. Sus, check two. So you were assigned this at birth and you were put into a system where you've been traded publicly on the stock market. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. I don't want to blow you guys' faces off up front. But so this all caps name is called your straw man. Okay, that's the basics. You can go look into it if you want. Watch that documentary. You'll have a basic understanding. Now, this all caps name, it's a legal fiction, right? Back to Trump's tweet. It's a what's called a legal fiction. So it's a dead entity. It represents you, but it's not you. It's as if there's two parts of humans and one is a legal fiction and it's fake and it's used like a poster to engage in the system. And then one is real and we don't know the difference between the two. And that is where all of our problems arise. That's where all of these problems arise. Okay. So a corporation, let's start to get into words. Corp oration. Do you remember in elementary school when they had you like sounding out syllables? Corporation, right? Like you had to break down like, what does this mean? And then what does this mean? And then that's how you figured out advanced words until your unconscious mind memorized these things. So corporation, there's two roots here. Corp oration, right? Now let's break those two down. Corp, Latin root, comes from corpse. Probably not, you know, I probably don't have to convince you of that. It's exactly how it sounds. Corp comes from corpse. What does corpse speak to or deal with? The dead. Okay, so the first part of this word means dead. Now let's go a little bit deeper. Oration. What is oration? Well, I want you to think about, have you ever heard someone being described as a great orator? Or have you ever heard the word orate? That means to speak. If you're a great orator, you're a great speaker. So now we put these two together. And corporation means dead speak. Why does it mean dead speak? What the hell does that mean? Where does that come from? Well, I want you to think about what I've been talking about, about the black ink, about the legal fictions, and about your straw man. Dead entities cannot speak. What good is a phone call if you're unable to speak? They can't. Therefore, how does this whole system work then? Jeremy, you said everything, everything is a legal fiction. You said that humans can't even engage in any aspect of the system. Humans can't have a license. Humans can't pay taxes. Humans can't accept debt. Humans can't lend. Humans can't do any of that. A legal fiction has to. Hmm. So how does it all work then? Here's how it works. Dead entities. I want you to think about zombie movies or like the walking dead. What do dead entities need? They need fresh blood, don't they? They need life force, don't they? So here's how this works. Dead entities need life, living, they need credit. Life and credit are the same thing. Maybe I'll get into that later. They need living beings to feed off of or take over to give them life. Now, this is probably the most spiritual aspect of all of the studying you're ever going to do in sovereignty and law. I'm going to say it a few times so it starts to sink in. Here is why all of this shit is spiritual. Jeremy, why are you always trying to make credit spiritual? Why do you always try to talk about money as if it's spiritual? Well, first off, everything is spiritual, but some people don't agree with that lens. But particularly this topic, I need you to understand this because this is just basically understood law. I'm not saying anything advanced yet. This is super basic. Corp oration means dead speak. Corporations are referred to as dead entities. Think about it. 
An LLC can't run itself. It never can. It never will. It is impossible. A C Corp can't run itself. It can't start itself. You need humans inside of the dead entity giving it life in order to propel it forward or it wouldn't be able to exist. The banks work the same way. The U.S. corporation, the IRS, the governments, the bureaus, they all work the same way. They're dead. They can't speak. So what do they do in order to continue on or in, in order to grow in power? They try to leech off of our life force energy. Now, I want you to think about that from a more spiritual or holistic lens. Why is there shit in our food? Why is there poison in our water? Why are we fed what we're fed in the media? Why are we driven to fight each other, etc., continually polarized? Same thing. They're trying to leech your life force energy. Because if you wake up to this stuff, you are literally the worst nightmare of the system. You are Neo when he realizes he's the fucking one. Try to take from us. Purpose. And Agent Smith loses it. He realizes it's a wrap. It's over. That's the gravity of this conversation. Whether or not you take it seriously is up to you. But this is realer than real. I can assure you as someone who lives this life. So this is the purpose of all U.S. citizens and non-sovereign persons. This is why they want you to have a birth certificate. This is why you get incorporated before you're to before you're of age to understand any of this. This is why your parents don't know this. This is why you've never been taught this. This is why I probably sound crazy. Because if you knew, you wouldn't consent. And if you don't consent, the system weakens. At scale, if we all stop consenting and turning ourselves into legal fictions, well, the system has to have legal fictions to run itself. And if it can't, it crumbles. This is what I mean when I talk about sovereignty. It's not about getting some passport. <laughs> it's not about becoming some tribe. It's not even necessarily about going and living off of the land. It's much, in a way, simpler than that. I I'm talking spiritually. You need to understand the energetics of being leached off of. Imagine having a massive parasite in you since you were born. Well, now, guess what? You don't have to imagine anymore. You have one. It's massive. And imagine how different your life would look if you did a parasite cleanse. I'm talking metaphorically, of course. And you shit out a fucking garden snake. Well, guess what, guys? You have a garden snake in you. If you're a citizen, you have one. And you have a choice. To take some things, aka devote yourself to the sovereignty process, learning law, learning to exert your rights, etc. And you can shit that out. What would your life look like? That is what I want you to think about. So now I'm going to start to get a little bit deeper. We're going to go into Admiralty Maritime Law, which I made a post that was really popular. You got A lot of you shared it. A lot of you saved it. Thank you for that. If you haven't seen it, you can go check it out. It was a swipe file on water words. And I talked about Admiralty Maritime Law. And I want to get a little bit into it here where I can be a little bit more thorough and explain for you guys. But before I start, we'll put it up on the screen. But I want to show you the definition of Admiralty here straight from Cornell Law. So it says Admiralty. Admiralty Law or Maritime Law is the distinct body of law, both substantive and procedural governing navigation and shipping topics associated with this field in legal reference works may include shipping navigation waters commerce seamen towage wharves piers docks insurance 
maritime liens, canals, and recreation. The courts and Congress seek to create a uniform body of admiralty law, both nationally and internationally, in order to facilitate commerce. The federal courts derive their exclusive jurisdiction over this field from the Judiciary Act of 1787. Sorry, 1789. I'll read one more, one more excerpt from the last paragraph. Admiralty law in the United States developed from the British admiralty courts present in most American colonies. These courts function separately from courts of law and equity. There's so much that I could say here, but just understand that when I talk about the United States being owned by Europe, being owned by Britain, being owned by foreign banking cartels, it's no coincidence that we used to deal in equity, which is fairness. Equity is an extremely fair way to go about law. And we, somewhere along the line, apparently in 1787, slowly shifted, maybe not so slowly, but slyly shifted into admiralty maritime law, treating humans First, we have to trick them. We have to get them to consent and turn themselves into legal fictions, corporations. And then we have to govern them as if they're a vessel, a ship, right? So you, it might not be clicking yet. You, this is how you are governed. This is how corporations are governed. And this is how you are governed. Why? Well, because Admiralty Maritime Law is where all of the laws reside that fuck us. All of the unfair statutes, mandates, laws and legislation that just keeps coming out, keeps coming out, keeps coming out. This is all under the blanket realm of admiralty maritime law. And what happens with admiralty maritime law is your rights are pretty much screwed. And the solution will step one to the solution is you have to first understand why are you being governed that way? You're only being governed that way because you're consenting to being a legal fiction. If you were to remove yourself from consenting to being a legal fiction, now all of a sudden you can, for example, live and opt to be treated in a way under equity law or under common law, right? Private law, which is how humans, blood and flesh, natural people were meant to live. So. Now we're going to go even deeper and we're going to talk about some water words. So the reason I want to break this down is so that you can understand. So there's not, there's not a shadow of a doubt in your mind around what, what are you talking about, Jeremy? This, is, this seems like a stretch. So I'm always saying, especially to my students, but even publicly, everything in life is commerce. Why is everything in life commerce? Because you were first turned into a legal fiction. Now, legal fictions are governed under Admiralty Maritime Law, and Admiralty Maritime Law treats every activity of a legal fiction as a commercial activity. I'm going to say that again. Step one, you were turned into a legal fiction. Step two, legal fictions don't have rights. Step three, legal fictions are governed under a body of law called Admiralty Maritime Law. Step four, Admiralty Maritime Law treats every interaction as a contractual engagement in commerce. It treats everything you do because remember, you're a business, you're a legal fiction. So everything a business does is a business transaction, is it not? Everything a business does is commercial, is it not? So Jeremy, why are you always saying all crimes are commercial? Why are you always saying everything is commerce? Because it is. You can't do anything that isn't commerce because you're a corporation right now. You're dead. And you're being governed under Admiralty Maritime Law. So let's start to get into some water words and really breaking this down. And if you guys want to learn more about this, you're going to want to check out Jordan Maxwell's old work on Admiralty Maritime Law. He was an expert at etymology. <clears throat> he spent decades learning this stuff. So I'm just a student of the game here. But let's talk a little bit about it. So first and foremost, for anyone familiar with ships or uh, navigation or anything like that at a basic level, you'll know that all ships are female, right? Why is that? Well, ships deliver product, don't they? 
And let's let's think in a commercial sense, right? We're not talking about fishing, blah, blah, blah. Like if you own a boat, we're talking about like the larger purpose of like what the oceans are really for, which has and always has been trade. So ships deliver product, right? Just like when you're pregnant, you're pregnant with the product and then you deliver, right? I'll get to that. So when you deliver, when your mom delivers, or if you're a woman, when you deliver, the child is the product. And when you come out as the child, you come out of what's called the birth canal, right? So I'm going to put up on the screen the word birth, and they give you a birth certificate. At that moment, they're monetizing you. You're the product. You came out of your mom. Your mom is the vessel, the ship. She's female because she births the product, just like a ship. You come out and... Why is it called a birth canal? Where the hell did that come from? Why is it called a birth certificate? Well, we have to look at this word birth. The original word birth is B-E-R-T-H. And I'll have it up on the screen, but it says, comes from the 1620s. It used to mean a convenient sea room for ships or for sailors. What? Water word. Birth has everything to do with ships or sailors. But wait a minute. I thought my mom's a human and she birthed me. Remember what we're talking about. Your mom has a birth certificate. She birthed you. You have a birth certificate. So an entity, a corporation, birthed an, a product, a corporation. This was a commercial activity. Birth, even the most sacred thing on earth. A woman bringing life into the universe has been commercialized. And that is the fucking problem. So let's go a little further. Your body, your mom's body, now your body, is a business. It is a corporation. And when it dies, it becomes a corpse. Then we have ships. Ships are referred to as vessels, are they not? A vessel in the sea. But then we also have bodies. Don't we refer to our bodies as vessels? Like you only have one vessel, treat it well, right? We've all heard that right? Or cleaning your vessel. Have you ever thought about that? Why do ships and bodies, why do they both allude to vessels? Same thing here. Because a ship is a commercial product. It carries product and then it comes into the birth canal, right? It docks in the birth and it product is offloaded. That's a commercial activity. Well, our bodies, back to us being called chattel, our bodies are now thought of as vessels, but not the kind of vessel you're probably used to, like your meat suit or thinking of it in that way. It is a commercial vessel. It is very much so viewed that way. A set of numbers, a product to be commercialized, taxed, et cetera. It's a legal fiction. So now let's go a little bit more into, a little deeper into the concepts of court. So your court, when you go into court, there's what's called a court gate right? Like when you walk through and it does this, right? That's called a floodgate. Have you ever, did you know that? If you've been to court, you know that. It's called a floodgate. Why is it called a floodgate? Have you ever thought about that? It's called a floodgate because you're entering onto the water. When you go through that gate, you just stepped off of land onto water. What? I'm going to say that again. When you go through that, you step off of land onto water. So in other words, if you've ever consented or made the mistake of going into court unknowingly because they're calling your straw man into court, but you don't know that. So you think, oh shit, I have to go. I have to defend myself. Blah, blah, blah. blah. I have to go to the hearing. And you go there. You, the natural person, are speaking on behalf of the legal fiction and you don't know that. They're trying to talk to something dead and you're speaking as a live person. When you step through the floodgate, you are now in admiralty maritime jurisdiction. It is as if you stepped onto the water, onto a ship, and you are going to be governed as such. The truth is always in plain sight. It's always there. We just weren't, we were trained to not see it. That's what it is. So unlearning is the most important step. Another parallel here, when you're born, you come out of your mom's floodgate, if you think about it. So in here, you can think of that as it was land, it was earth, you were part of your mom. As soon as you came out of her, 
you came out of her floodgate, literally. There was a flood coming out when you came out. And you stepped into Admiralty Maritime Jurisdiction. This stuff is crazy to think about. Let's go a little further. What happens if you get arrested? Here we go dealing with the government policy enforcers again. Courts, policy enforcers, cops, etc. So you get arrested. You have to get bailed out of jail, right? But what is a bail used for? A bail is like a shovel or a pail that's used to remove water from a ship, from a boat. Another water word, bailed. Now let's think about the banks. Where do you keep your money? In a bank. Interesting. What guides and directs water? Think of a river or a stream. Banks. River banks, right? Interesting. What happens when you want to send something, whether commercially or personally, even though when you personally send something, it is commercial. You just don't know that. You have to ship it. Ship. Shipping. Water word. What do we call liquidity or cash flow? We call it cash flow. We call it liquidity. Liquidate. If you want to sell something, liquidate it. Why are all of these water words? Because we're in a system treating us under the laws of admiralty maritime jurisdiction and we never ever knew it you were never taught this it was intentionally hidden from you and you were actually not only not taught this but you were taught the exact opposite so that you continue sheepishly giving your consent so that the system can strengthen you we have to allow them to govern us in the way that we are you have a say in these things that's the problem. So we have a birth canal and a birth certificate, right? We talked about that. And then what happens when you come out? Well, you come out and who needs to sign your birth certificate? The doctor, right? Doc. We often call him doc, right? How are things looking, doc? What is a doc? A doc is where ships tie up more water words. Then there's a lot of times in the commercial systems, we use the word report right? It can be used for any number of things. Report. What is that root word? Hort. Hort. It's one of the most common roots in the English language is port. There's a lot of words that come from the root of port. Port is alluding to water. So a report is alluding to water. So that's just a quick rundown of a lot of these water words and showing you just how Right in front of us, it has been this entire time. All of these water words. And it's nothing fancy here. Like, this should all be very obvious when I'm talking about it. You're just like, yeah, that that's, it sounds exactly like that. The reason that I show you this isn't necessarily because it, it's not as practical, if you will. This is more of a basic foundational understanding that you need in order to shift your mind to understand that this is how you're being governed. That's why all these words are in the system. That's why banks aren't called something else. That's why it's called liquidate. That's why it's called cash flow. That's why it's called birth. We have to understand. So I'm giving you guys more clues so that you can see things from different angles here. So now I want to go a little bit into debt, the etymology of debt. So we're going to put it up on the screen once again. Debt. First definition talks about anything owed or due from one person to another, a liability, an obligation to pay. Okay, perfect. Sounds pretty typical, right? But then we keep going. Originally, the definition was to keep something away from someone. Hmm. Hold on. Jeremy, you just taught us how we were turned into a legal fiction when we were just freshly born into the world we were turned into a legal fiction and that legal fictions are dead entities and they don't have rights then you taught us that dead entities are governed under maritime admiralty law and that's where all of these problems come from then you taught us that the reason all crimes are commercial and the reason that all of life is commerce is because for our entire life we've never had a waking moment where we weren't a dead entity living it and we were being treated as such. So having said all of that, we should really understand now that credit is spiritual. And if we can start to understand that credit is spiritual, what do you think they are keeping away from you? Just look at the definition. 
to keep something away from someone else. Hmm, maybe your power, maybe your freedom, maybe your understanding of who the fuck you actually are and how powerful you are as God's child. So this is one of the basics, and I know many of you have probably learned this, but there's also going to be a lot of people who have. When you start to unravel, we first have to learn what words mean. Then we have to look into words we thought we knew what they meant. We start to realize, holy shit, this doesn't mean what it, what I thought at all, right? So let's keep going with this. Next, we're going to put up government. We're going to start to look at what, is, what does government mean? And this one, once again, I was talking about how we have to break down each of the little roots and we have to separately learn what they mean, right? So with government, we're going to have to put up govern, and then we're going to have to put up men, and then we're going to have to put up another angle of men. So govern, of course, it's talking about to rule with authority, to govern, to rule, to command, etc. Then when we go to the, we'll go a little further, once again, we're, we're, when we have the choice, we're always looking for the original definition, original. So if you can ever find where it says originally, what did it mean? That's what we're going for. Originally, govern meant to steer or to pilot. It even goes on to say to steer or to pilot a ship, which is hilarious to me because look at everything we've been talking about. If the government is supposedly an, an entity that helps guide the people in a system of humans, that's what we have been taught. And we start to look into the root of govern, and it's actually talking about it means to steer or pilot a ship. And we start to understand that this whole United States corporation is governed under Admiralty Maritime Law because not only is the government what you think of as the government a corporation, but what you think of as yourself and your mom and your dad and your friend and your neighbor are corporations. Everything is a ship. It's commerce. It's Admiralty Maritime. It's water. It's bananas how this has been in front of our eyes the whole time, but we were not taught this. So that's what govern meant. That's what govern itself means, to steer, to pilot. Now let's go look over here at men. It talks about to, the first definition it talks about is to think. The Proto-Indo-European root of men, M-E-N, is to think. And then I'm bringing up another one coming from the word mental, but it's just men. It says it comes from Sanskrit, meaning mind or spirit. Now let's put this together. So govern, the original root word of govern means to steer or pilot, and meant means the mind or spirit. Let's put them together. Government, to steer or pilot the mind and spirit. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to enlightenment. So this is the power of learning words. And there's so many, you know, we could give 20 hours of, you know, education just on basic words, but we're going to leave that for you guys. I'm showing you how to think about things. I'm giving you a little bit of my spirit and my, my awareness, but now, you know, we're going to be setting you guys free. I just wanted to show you a few different words. Debt, does not mean what you think. Something's being kept from you. Your job is to find out what. Government isn't what you think. It's not these bureaus that you think are uh, not corporations. It's quite literally they're letting you know. Otherwise, they would have changed their name, right? The truth is always in plain sight. We know that that's a spiritual principle. They're letting you know that their job is to steer or pilot your mind and spirit. I don't know about you, but that's a no from me, dog, right? And if you're listening to this, if you watch our show, if you listen to our show, I have a hunch that it's a no from you as well. So now we're going to break down a uh, corporation. We'll put that on the screen. So there's going to be two parts. There's, we can look at the word corporation, but we can also look at oration. So when we look at corporation from the mid 15th century, it talks about persons united in a body for some purpose. That sounds great. 
But we keep going, we keep going, we keep going. Where does it come from? We finally find a section where it says, from corpus, and I quote, body, dead body, animal body. Okay. So corporation, if you look it up, and guys, this is all coming from etymology dictionary, the free etymology dictionary. There's a free app. You can also use it online. So you just type these words in and you will see everything I'm showing you. So corporation, it's letting us know that it comes from the root body or dead body. Okay, interesting. Now we look at oration. First, it's talking about a prayer, etc. Where does it come from? And I quote, speaking, speech, discourse, language. Okay, so exactly what I was telling you guys about. Corporation, dead body, but it's speaking. How is that working, right? So it's dead speak or dead body speaking. So when I always tell you guys, dead entities don't have rights, or I tell you citizens don't have rights, or I just say, hey, you don't have rights. A lot of you might not fully, like the gears might not fully be turning clearly enough. So let me reiterate why I'm saying these things. It's not to be cute. It's not to be funny. It's not to be um, half truthful. I'm being literal. All cap citizens don't have rights because you're dead and dead entities can't speak. You're treated and classified and done business with contractually, commercially as a dead entity. Yeah. And then we go out and we protest or we vote even worse. Or we, we do things where we think we're going to make a difference, but you're a dead entity with a picket sign. You're a dead entity thinking you're going to the ballot box and making a difference. You're not even being honored as a living soul. You're a number. You're in a database. You're being commercialized. You're being sold on the stock exchange. If only you knew that when you came out of your mom, you were stamped and put on the conveyor belt and turned into a product. That's why it's called a birth canal, right? So these entities, they need your credit. They need your life. And I haven't gotten too much into the credit side of it. But for those of you who do your studying, those of you who are aware, we are the original creditors. Whenever you enter into banking or commercial relationships with anything or anyone, because you have a social or a signature that grants all of the credit in the system. It doesn't come from the system and then we borrow it. It comes from us and then the system borrows it. They're the debtors. They trick us and get us to consent to being the debtors, but that's not the situation. So it's important you understand that your credit is life. Because you're alive, a natural person, you have credit. If you were dead, you wouldn't have credit. Does that make sense? All credit comes from life. This is more of a spiritual understanding. And what all of these dead entities that make up the system that we were born into do and need to do is leech off of you. And they can't do that if you know their tricks. See the problem here? See why you weren't taught this? <laughs> so what is a credit report? We're going to put these up on the screen as well. Credit and then report. So credit per the 1540s means to believe or to be sure of the truth of is credit. To believe or to be sure of the truth of. And then report, as of the late 14th century, means rumor. One of the definitions, rumor. So credit report, let's put it together. To believe a rumor or to be sure of the truth of a rumor. Interesting. Is that not the whole issue with Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, CRAs, consumer reporting agencies that call themselves bureaus? They have nothing to do with the government. These are for-profit corporations. Isn't that the whole issue? They're reporting rumors. And when you start to dive into 15 USC 1681B, you can clearly see even if you have no background in law, you've never read a legal code, go look that up right now. 15 USC 1681B, I want you to read right there where it tells you 
Consumer reporting agencies are only allowed to report things on your credit under the following circumstances and no other. And one of the first things it says is with the written permission of the consumer to whom it pertains. Have you ever given TransUnion written permission to report delinquent, late payments, missed payments, closed accounts, high utilization? Have you ever given them permission to do that? It's hilarious to me. And it's also like, oh, well played. Like you start to wake up to these things and then you start to actually look into them. Like you, you no longer try to bury your head in the sand, spiritual bypassing, distractionism, coping. You, you just you're like, all right, rip the bandaid off. Let's fucking look at the darkness. And you start to go into it. It's hilarious because it's all right there. It's all right in front of you. What is a credit report? It's to believe a rumor. They're letting you know that this shit's not even truth. It's not even factual. It's a rumor. And all of these words are right there. They've always been there. We just haven't looked. Now I want to bring up the court system a little bit. And if you look up the word court in the etymology dictionary, you can find it as a noun and as a verb. And there's a few funny things, so I'm going to put them up on the screen as well. So if we look at court as a noun, it says formal assembly held by a sovereign. And I just thought that part was funny, so I wanted to show you guys. Because in the 12th century, apparently, court used to be dealing with sovereigns. Amazing. That doesn't happen anymore, but we still call it a court, which is very interesting. If you go a lot uh, further down in that same section, it talks about those assembled in the yard, semicolon, which means completely different thought, a company, comma, a cohort. Now, what am I always talking to you guys about? Policemen, sheriffs, judges, they're what we call policy enforcers. They work for debt collection companies. Let me explain. Let's say you live in San Diego and the the police force, the sheriffs, and the judges work for the San Diego federal or district court or like whatever court we're talking about, right? San Diego court. And you've been taught and you think of that as this big, scary entity that's the government. That is a for-profit corporation with an EIN, a Dun & Bradstreet number, and you can literally look it up on Dun & Bradstreet if you know how to find your shit. That is a for-profit corporation. Every single court that I'm aware of is a for-profit corporation. So if the court itself is a for-profit corporation, then the judge works for a for-profit corporation. And who fills the judge's courtroom? Policy enforcers, policemen, and sheriffs. So then who do the policemen and sheriffs work for? They say, oh, we pledged an oath to the Constitution. Oh, we pledge an oath to protect the citizens of the whatever county. No, they didn't. Their first and foremost obligation, which if sometimes they'll actually be truthful and tell you, is to the company they work for. It's not that they even know they work for it. It's to fill the court because this is a business. Remember, it's all commerce. So even they are legal fictions. So these are businesses battling against your business, which you thought of yourself up until today as a human. You're not. You're a legal fiction and they're legal fictions. When a policeman pulls you over, that's a business coming up to your window to try to do business with you. And whatever you say is going to be what's called a verbal or implicit or implied contract, meaning it's not written down and signed. Now a ticket might be, but let's say you go, hey, officer, blah, 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 blah. And then he goes, step out of the vehicle. I don't like gratitude and blah, blah, blah. That right there was a legal contract that could have been transcribed and signed. It's the same thing. Your business, he's a business. You're talking as businesses, you're contracting, and you don't realize that every time you open your mouth, you incriminate yourself because you're opening your mouth on behalf of a dead <coughs> entity and you're representing and answering yourself as that. Then you give them your license and say, yep, yeah, I'm that, I'm that dead entity and so on and so on and so on. So it, this shit is deep, guys. It takes years of unlearning. So don't be discouraged if you feel overwhelmed when you're listening to this right now. I know some of you are just going to be like, yep, that's basic, but it's basic if you've been doing the work for six to 12 to 18 months, but it's not when you're first time hearing this, right? On the one hand, we clearly see that court, one of the meanings of it is company. And I'm always talking about how their job, not only are they a company, 
but they're a for-profit company. And what's their business model? Well, they have to fill the courtroom and then they have to charge you with shit. That's their business model. They have to. Don't hate the player, hate the game. That's what they do. And it's right there for you because they're literally in the definition of court as a noun says company. Now let's look at it as a verb. Court as a verb has two definitions. I'm going to read the second one. It says solicit or seek to win or attract. That's another one that I think is pretty funny if you think about what a court actually is, right? Whenever you go in court, you're getting screwed in some way. They're trying to get you to pay things. You might have threats of jail time, blah, blah, blah. They're soliciting you. What is a solicitor? A solicitor, I mean, humans, at least Americans, don't like solicitors so much so that it's extremely common to put a sign up in your front window that says, no solicitors, keep away. Solicitors try to come sell you something. They try to come persuade you in some sort of idea, but it's always unwanted. You didn't ask for it, right? And what is a court doing? Did you ask for that? Is it are they not trying to persuade you of some way of thinking or sell you something? That's what's fucking crazy when you start to realize it what a court really is. They're trying to sell you something because guess what? If you know if you're a master with words, both can articulate it verbally and via writing. You don't step in a court. And if you did, you know exactly how to speak, how to move, and they don't are they are not able to do shit. But that is their job. They're a company who's trying to solicit you. <laughs> if we combine the definitions, they're a solicitation company. A little bit of a different definition than you may have been taught when you were shown propaganda videos about how court, or if you've ever gone to jury duty and they play the stupid patriotic videos about like, your job is really important here on jury duty and it's your patriotic duty and trying to promote nationalism and all that, right? That is a for-profit corporation and you're being fed outdated propaganda. <laughs> so now let's go into solicit because it can go even deeper. We could interpret it how I just did, but let's look at the action. Let's not make any assumptions because this is how you want to study law. So I'm showing you guys as a case study so you can copy it. Let's go deeper. What does solicit mean? I know it as meaning, you know, to sell, blah, blah, blah. Let's try to persuade you of something. Here's what the etymology of solicit means as a verb. To disturb or trouble, to harass, to provoke. Wow. So now let's read that again. Court is known to mean solicit or seek to win or attract. Solicit. So if court is to solicit, well, what is solicit? So court is to disturb. So to court someone, to bring them into a court, is to disturb them, is to trouble them, is to harass them, is to provoke them. Imagine that. What do they do in courtrooms? They try to incriminate you. Everything about it, from the way it's laid out in an intimidating manner, to the way that they make you feel, to the way that they make you wait, to how cold of an atmosphere it is, to how they try to intimidate you and make you think that you can never speak for yourself and you always need an attorney. Everything about the court system is meant to break you, to disturb you, to provoke you. So you trip up so they can get their hard-earned dollars. <laughs> this shit goes deep. And we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to talk about the bar. So for those of you who are unaware, lawyers have to pass what's called the bar test. They pledge an oath to the bar. A well-known thing, lawyers are what's called bar certified or they have passed the bar if they are a lawyer, at least in America. I know how that is as well as Europe. So we look up the word bar, which we're going to put on the screen. Talks about a whole body of lawyers, legal profession, et cetera. It has perfect, right? But then let's go to the bottom. It says, as a place where the business of court was done. Hold up. What? Jeremy's not playing around. No, he's not. <laughs> like I said, I keep my, I try to keep my conspiracy theories to myself. I don't put shit out that I can't back up. Reason being I don't want to be that person that's putting something out, gets called out, and they're like, oh, I don't really have any proof, right? I'm not trying to 
persuade people to think ludicrous shit that ha- th- that there's no proof of. This is the law. It's just really hard to see outside of our own existing beliefs. So let's read this again. Once again, lawyers have to pass the bar. Bar certified. Go look it up. It's very common. You have to pass the bar. if You're going to be a practicing lawyer. And what are we told in America, at least, and Europe? We're told if you ever have any legal trouble, you need an attorney or a lawyer to represent you. You cannot, you do not represent yourself. That is what we are taught. Huh, how convenient. And when we look at the bar, at the bottom here, it says, as a place, as the place where the business of court was done. Hmm. So they're letting you know right there, court is a business. It's been a business. It will continue to be a business. And you will continue to be on the losing end of that commercial transaction if you do not decide that this stuff, that this lifestyle, that this awakening and then embodiment and integration is worth your time. I also want to go into one more thing. So we see, I I skipped to the end there, but I do want to read this middle section. It says, after 1600, however, this was popularly assumed to mean the bar in a courtroom. So it has multiple meanings here. The wooden railing marking off the area around the judge's seat where prisoners stood for arraignment and where a barrister stood to plea. Okay. Well, now we need to know what's a barrister because I don't know off the top of my head, or at least I didn't. And you don't just want to assume things, especially when you're studying law. So it outlines the judge's seat. We get that. The more important part I want to go into here is where prisoners stood for arraignment and where a barrister stood to plea. Well, what's a barrister? So now we're going to bring up barrister on the screen. Barrister is defined as one practicing as an advocate in English courts of law. Holy shit. This is just coming full circle so beautifully. You guys ready? So I've talked about this a lot in our community. Hopefully you guys are aware of this. I've talked about it on other podcasts repeatedly. The United States is a corporation. Corporations have CEOs, founders, boards, et cetera, right? The United States corporation, you can also think of it as what's called the In God We Trust, different names, is owned by Europe. It is owned by England, Britain, old banking families, the crown, if you want to look into that. Now, we start to talk about the bar and we get into this concept of barrister. Okay, so the bar has always been referencing the business of court, how it was done. Okay, it also means where a barrister stood to plea. So as of now, let's assume it's a coincidence that the bar, the same test, why did they call it the bar test? Why did they have to make it called the bar for lawyers and attorneys? You have to pass the bar. Well, we're looking at the other definitions of the bar and we're seeing that it used to mean where a barrister stood to plea. And when we look at what a barrister means, it's one practicing as an advocate in English courts of law, but we're in America. Why are we using the bar? Why do we require our attorneys and lawyers to pass the bar? Why are we told we can't self-represent and we're intimidated, coerced, and forced into hiring lawyers or attorneys who work for the bar? What is the bar? Well, the bar is an association that isn't even American. It is owned by the same European, English, British, cartels, families that I'm talking about that own the United States Corporation. That is who created the bar. Go research it. So what tests do all lawyers and attorneys have to pass to become licensed? The bar. We established that. So they're practicing, per the definition of bar, a business of court for a foreign land, for a foreign land. England is foreign to the U.S., is it not? We know that Barrister is referencing an advocate in English courts. People that pass the bar are typically American attorneys, American lawyers. So this is where you start to go, hmm, something's not adding up. 
Why is this required? Why is it such a strong system with a monopoly? There's no way around it. You have to be certified in that. There's no other options. And why is the bar not even American? Who's controlling the curriculum of the bar? Hmm. Maybe those that created it? So once again, we have a conflict of interest because we have what you've been taught is a nation called the United States, but it's not. It's a corporation. And you've been taught that a bunch of people, millions and millions of people make up a nation and you all share values and similarities and land and et cetera. But that's not what it is at all. You, none of you are people. You're all persons, you're all corporate legal fictions, and you all are inside of one giant corporation called the United States. And a select few who are lucky enough reach levels of consciousness high enough to see what's going on and break out of that. The Matrix is a system, Neil. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. And they're no longer inside of the United States Corporation. And that type of person threatens the very stability and survival of the system that I'm talking about. Because this system, as one of its backstops, uses fear enforced by courts, governments. It uses fear of consequences hashed out in court to get you to continue playing into their game of you being the yeah. fiction and them somehow having power over you. Another man, for some reason, at somewhere along the line, you learned and accepted that another man gets to tell you what to do. And this is how it all works. This is how it's all laid out. A foreign Foreign families, a select few foreign families with enough money, a smart enough plan, and a serious ability to make sinister plans come to fruition, control the entire United States because they control the monetary system, they've controlled our government and how it was set up and the illusion that there is a government, there's not a government anymore. These are just corporations and they're for profit. And where does the money ultimately go to at the top of the top of the top? Well, it trickles up, trickles up, trickles up, right? So it goes from the police and then they enforce to fill the courts and the courts. But where does the court money go to? It eventually all trickles up to who owns the corporation? Who owns the United States corporation? Foreign insurgents, foreign powers. So that is where we're at. And I'm going to do one more quick walkthrough, and then we're going to wrap things up for our etymology masterclass. Understanding the court system. When you walk through the gate of a courtroom, you walk through what's called the floodgate, water word. The floodgate symbolizes you stepping off of land onto water, hence why it's called the floodgate. Once you're on the water or in a ship, you're no longer in the jurisdiction of the land. That's how they trick you. That's how they're able to rule over you and a judge can sentence you. A man is not allowed to rule over a man on land, law of the land, which is common law. You're not allowed to do that. They have to trick you to consent to this fake pseudo law as a legal fiction. If you go, yo, the gig's up. I'm not a legal fiction. I'm not consenting to that. I'm not stepping on your ship. Oh my God, that's the worst nightmare. So when you do that, you step, check this out. You're, you're, you're on the land. You go through the floodgate. Now you're stepping into foreign jurisdiction, foreign jurisdiction, the law of the water. You're dealing with basically courts of England. You're dealing with laws that come from foreign insurgents, and you're being ruled over by a policy enforcer, aka a judge, that was hired and pledged to the bar. And the bar is from Europe, England, Britain. 
Now, the lawyers who represent you, but they don't, they have an oath to the court above you, ask them. The, the lawyers who supposedly represent you have to pass the bar, which we showed you is defined as where the business of court is done. Barristers are those who practice law under the bar exam. Barristers, barristers, whatever. But when we showed you guys the definition of that, what it actually means is advocates in England courts of law. Wait a minute. Why the hell are American attorneys advocates of England courts of law? Maybe it's because this whole thing, this whole construct that you were programmed called court, it's not actually real. It doesn't actually exist if you stood on the land, if you realize what an American means before you got turned into a legal fiction. You have someone representing a foreign insurgent next to you, supposedly representing you. You're standing on foreign land because you stepped through the floodgate and now you're treated as if you're on a ship. And because you're on a ship, you can obviously go across land to foreign territory. So you're treated as such. The judge is ruling upon you as if you're in a foreign place because you are. None of this you knew, but it doesn't make it any less true. This is what you guys need to understand. The judge only has jurisdiction inside of the floodgate. That's the only time while you're on the ship. But he doesn't have jurisdiction over those in the audience or those outside of the courtroom. It's fake. It's a play. It's like theater. And you're consenting. This is what's bananas to me about people getting scared about some of the things I talk about where they're like, you're going to go to jail for tax evasion or not paying your taxes, blah, 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 Wesley Snipes. I'm like, the only people that that happens to are celebrity scapegoats who are so idiotic. They just listen to what their lawyer says and they're like, take the deal. <laughs> they're just treated as a, as a legal fiction and they deserve that because of their lack of education and knowledge. So back to Deuteronomy 15, for those of you who haven't studied that, that is a masterclass on commerce. Go, go study that. Deuteronomy 15. What did Deuteronomy tell us about how we should be interacting and doing commerce with foreigners? That's your homework. One of them. I've given you a few. Go look at what straight from God's mouth, God's law, what did Deuteronomy tell us about how we should be interacting with and doing commerce with foreigners? Because now you're learning all of this is foreigners. When you go into court, you're dealing with foreigners. When you're talking to an attorney, you're dealing with a foreigner. I know it doesn't seem like it. They can be born and raised in America. It doesn't matter. Nothing is what it seems, right? Even you, your whole life, you've looked in the mirror and you're like, I'm a person. No, you're not. You're a legal fiction. Life is not what it seems. And this is why The Matrix is like the most accurate commerce movie of all time. It's not what you think. Nothing is. Now, when we, when we want to bring it full circle, I've taught on this. Hopefully, you guys uh, recall. Who took over the United States, Inc. after the United States state, back when it actually was a, a state, a nation, a body? Who took over after it went bankrupt in the late 1800s, early 1900s? Who took over? Foreign powers. I've talked about it repeatedly. I've done a podcast on it. Foreign insurgents. That is who I was talking about. Those foreign insurgents. Foreign families. English. British, the crown, they bought the U.S. on sale, turned us all into property, turned the U.S. into a corporation, but no one told anyone. They could not have that out. And we're still in that system right now. And so the courts, the bar, maritime, all of it, it's an elaborate hoax. It's a play. It's a theater. It's a psyop. It's one perspective, but you have the option to look, to start seeing things for what they are. And it is not what you've been taught. The U.S. court system, there's so much like nat promoted nationalism and propaganda about it, right? Like it's your civic duty. That's what they say. The U.S. court system isn't even American. The U.S. is a corporate, like I, I really want you to zoom out. Close your eyes right now. And I want you to think about this. Let's think about the publicly traded company, Apple. Now, I want you to think about if tomorrow Tim Cook announced that He's resigning as Apple CEO, and a Saudi prince has bought Apple. Okay? 
for $3 trillion. You would understand immediately that when you were buying iPhones, you were buying and enriching and doing business with Saudi Arabia, would you not? It would cause a huge issue. You'd have all these racist people pulling out. You'd have people who are like, I don't want to make them more powerful, changing. It would change everything with commerce, with Apple, right? It would completely shift the company. The United States is in the same boat. The United States is owned by Europe and Britain and the crown. So every aspect inside of the business, courts are an aspect of it, how police work, policy enforcement, all the bureaus, all of the different systems, right? Taxation, monetary systems, the collection of things, all of it to keep things orderly and going and continuing on are technically foreign. They've been hired and put in place by foreign insurgents. So I really hope this is starting to click, guys. <laughs> the U.S. is merely a corporation owned by foreign powers, and the courts are literally just that corporation's debt collectors. And while at sea, under maritime law, everything is commerce. So I hope those are your two biggest takeaways here. We're going we're gonna to wrap things up because this has been a long one. This might be the longest solo podcast I've done, but... I would really like you guys' feedback on this episode and let me know, do you prefer this new style of approach where we're giving you guys visuals, we're giving you guys a full masterclass instead of just, um, you know, me kind of riffing and, you know, I go in depth into topics, don't get me wrong, I have my notes and such, but this is much more similar to a full structured masterclass of where we pick a topic and we give you a foundational understanding and then we give you homework and we give you things you can look deeper into. So let me know in the comments or you know when you reshare this or shoot me a DM. If you guys are watching on YouTube, definitely let me know in the comments uh, what you prefer. Um, we're definitely upgrading our content and I'm really excited to continue providing more value for as many of you possible for free. Outside of that, I hope you guys, you know, got value from this. And and I think what I'll end it off on is if your mind's in a place of like, okay, great, you know, so what do we do now, Jeremy? I understand that's going to be uh, common for the brain to do when you consume information like this. It's It's looking to make meaning. It's trying to turn chaos into order. But what I need to remind you of is that now is not the time for you to go, what do I do about it? How do I take action? I'm ready. I just introduced you to the very basics of words. You should spend the next few months going into Black's Law 4th Edition, the Dictionary of Word Origins, the Dictionary of Banking Terms, Black's Law Dictionary 11th Edition Deluxe, and the Bible. These are up here for a reason. They're not just for looks. You have to start with the basis. It's just like when you were learning English. You had to first learn letters before you could learn words, and you had to first learn words before you could do sentences. Think of going sovereign or removing yourself from the tax system or correcting your status or discharging debt. Think of those things as writing complex sentences. First, you have to learn letters and then you have to learn words. And that's going to take practice and repetition until your subconscious mind understands all of this at a default level, which takes first unlearning, then relearning. So take this as more of an awareness episode, more of an expand your mind episode. And now you have homework to do. You have work to do. You have some books to get. You have some study to start doing consistently, going into your own words, starting to make sense of your own things, starting to take your own notes so that you can literally rewrite the scripts that dictate your awareness of what words mean, what is true, what isn't true. And that is going to strip away so much fear and give you so much strength that you'll stand a way better chance spiritually of actually seeing this through because you should not start this path if you are not ready to see it through all the way. And I can assure you, this is spiritual warfare. 
This is not for the faint of heart. I know sovereignty is trendy and it's sexy and it's a buzzword right now, but a big focus of my content is letting people know realistically what this life takes. We never sell people on a quick fix or a pipe dream. If you're not willing to put in a year, two years, five years, do not start. So with that, thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you've watched until the very end, we appreciate you so much. Please let us know below how we did. Let us know any feedback you have for us. Which content style did you like best? And we will catch you guys in the next episode. Peace and love, my friends.